What we're gonna look at here is another method for reducing our execution path length. And in this case, we're gonna see this can actually improve our speed a little bit more than the two methods that we've considered previously, which were merging our main one into each microcode sequence and adding a third full bus, our A bus. And so in this video, what we're gonna talk about is the addition of an instruction fetch unit or an IFU. And what this instruction fetch unit is going to be doing is essentially incrementing our PC and sort of pre-fetching a lot of the bytes which are coming from our ISA level instruction byte stream. And it's doing all of this completely independent of our main execution unit. And what we're gonna see is that this is going to free up our ALU a lot more and for a lot more types of instructions than again, what we saw in our previous two videos. So there are a couple ways that we could design this. We could have our instruction fetch unit actually interpreting our operands and our bytes coming in and figuring out what it needs to do with it. Or sort of the simpler case, which we're gonna go over here, is we're gonna say really all our instruction fetch unit has to do is sort of just keep these operands and it has a one byte option and a two byte option. And then the main execution unit can tell the IFU which one it wants. And now, of course, the reason we're gonna have a one byte option and a two byte option is because different instructions have different types of operands. So for example, if we were to talk about our iStore instruction, so we could say our iStore, and so like we saw previously, that has some operand, which is var num. And so we saw that var num is a single byte. And so in that case, after seeing the iStore instruction, the main execution unit would ask for just one byte from the ISA level instruction stream. If instead we were talking about our go to instruction, we know the operand for our go to instruction was called offset and our offset was two bytes. And so in that case, our main execution unit would ask the IFU for two bytes. So now let's take a look at the actual example IFU that we're gonna consider. And so here I have the figure and page number in the textbook for where this is coming from. So we see that we've had to add a separate register. So we still have our MBR register, but now we're calling this MBR1, and we've added this MBR2. And the reason for that is our MBR1 is going to be supplying our single byte, if our main instruction unit just needs one byte, and our MBR2 is going to provide two bytes. So again, for example, if the previous MBR that was loaded told us we were doing an I store, then the main execution unit is gonna ask for a single byte because the operand var num is one byte. If, however, we have our previous instruction was go to, then the main execution unit knows that we're gonna have this two byte offset, so it's gonna ask for whatever stored in MBR2. And so the way that this works then is we can see we have this shift register and so what our shift register is doing is basically we just have a lot of space here and we can prefetch things from memory. And you can see we can store up to one, two, three, four, five, six bytes in our shift register. And at any given point in time, the oldest byte in our shift register is going to be in our MBR1. And the oldest two bytes are going to be in our MBR2. We see that the oldest one is actually in the left position and the second oldest one is in our right position. And so that actually checks out if you go back and you look at the notes where we looked at our go to instruction, you'll see that our index byte one comes in first, followed by our index byte two. Uh, so that's how we ordered that. So that's how those values, they come in from main memory, get put in our shift register, and then those are constantly getting updated and loaded into our MBR1 and our MBR2. Let's say, for example, our main instruction unit pulls our MBR1 onto our B bus our shift register, the contents move to the right, and then our MBR1 gets reloaded, our MBR2 gets reloaded. So we're, we're constantly adjusting this. But again, keep in mind, all of this is happening independently of our main execution unit. A couple other points here. So we have this IMAR. So this is sort of similar to the MAR register that we saw in our previous microarchitecture. And so what this IMAR is doing is this is responsible for fetching memory words, right? So we'll say this fetches words, and because we're talking about a 32-bit machine, a 32-bit system, we know it's then fetching four bytes, so 
our IMAR is going to fetch four bytes, right? And so we'll look at sort of how we keep track of that in a little bit. Um, but basically we can fetch four bytes and we can sort of make sure our shift register is, is staying full or as full as possible. Uh, we also have a dedicated incrementer down here. So our IMAR is getting incremented at the appropriate times. The connection of our IMAR to our address butts, so you'll see there's sort of some weird notation here with our two lower order bits. Uh, the way that this is connected to our address bus is similar to the way that our uh, MAR register is connected to the data bus. And so we can see that on page 4-5. So if you go back and look there, so on page 4-5, what you'll see is basically we had sort of this diagonal connection. So we had something like this. And ultimately, it ended up being that we were multiplying such that we're addressing words instead of addressing bytes. So when we do plus one here, we're actually saying plus one word and not plus one byte. And again, that's just because of how we're connected to the address bus. Uh, we also have a separate incrementer down here for our program counter, because even though we're fetching this from IMR, we still wanna keep track of where our program counter is. Uh, we do have the ability to write to our IMR and to our PC from the C bus, and we also have control signals telling us when we're gonna do that. But what we're gonna see is the only time that we actually end up needing to do that is if we have some jump or some branch. And so of course that could happen from something like our go to instruction, right? So we're no longer just incrementing PC, but we're going to some specific address. Of course that's true of our conditional and unconditional go to statements. Uh, that's also going to be a factor if we're talking about our invoke virtual or return function. So in any of those cases, we're loading our PC from our C bus. And so in the notes, what I have here below this in writing is sort of a description of all of this stuff, right? So we've got our shift register, which has a queue of bytes from the memory up to six. The main key thing about this is we no longer have that memory read delay, right? So as we've looked at previous instructions, we do a fetch, we say that's not going to be ready until two cycles later. Well, now we already have everything in our shift register, so we don't have to wait those two cycles. It's already here and ready to go. So right there, we already have speed improvement from that. And keep in mind too, we've sort of simplified things and we've said when we're doing those read cycles from memory, we're assuming we have a 100% hit rate in cache level one. Really though, if we have a miss at cache level one, we have to go to cache level two or higher levels, our time is just getting longer and longer. So in that case, this shift register is becoming more and more important in reducing our execution path length. Um, again, we just have our MBR one and two holding the oldest byte and oldest two bytes respectively. And uh, one thing to note is that we can load both of these onto the bus as signed or unsigned. So exact same way we talked about uh, before. So in the previous video, for example, we had our MBR U so MBR unsigned, the only difference now is we have the option uh, for one and two. So this would be the signed version, this would be the unsigned version. Uh, again, IMR is fetching words, so four bytes because we have a 32-bit machine. It's fetching that into our shift register. And then again, that connection we can see on page 4-5, we have separate incrementers for our PC and IMR. And so what this means is again, keep in mind, this is all happening independent. So everything up here in this diagram is happening independent of our main execution unit. So that means our microprogram no longer has to explicitly increment PC. And so now we're freeing up the ALU even more. So we, we've already talked about sort of a lot of ways that we've freed up our, our ALU to do more things. We don't have that read delay for memories. We don't have to explicitly increment our PC. Another thing that we'll talk about here in a little bit is we don't have to assemble uh, that offset. And that's gonna be particularly helpful if we have something like our go to where we have two bytes for our offset. So if you recall, what we had to do with that is we had to put the first byte into our H register and shift it. We had to wait for the second byte to come in, add that. Now we can just do that all in one step. The main execution unit can just say, give me what's in MBR2 and there is our 16-bit offset, simple as that. So oftentimes as we are designing in our hardware, it's useful to consider finite state machines or the FSM representation. 
And so here we see that FSM representation of our IFU, our instruction fetch unit. Again, here's the page and figure number for that in the textbook. And I know you all have seen FSMs before, but it might have been a while. So just as a refresher, remember anywhere we have these circles, these are our states and any of the lines are transitions between states. And so what we can see is, for example, if we start in state three, so this is if we have three words in our shift register, and let's say our main instruction unit asks for MBR1, so we just need one byte. So then we go down this transition, now we're in state two, we have two bytes in our shift register, and so what that's going to do is that's going to initiate a memory read via our IMR, and we're gonna fetch a word, so now we have six bytes. And maybe at this point, we do an MBR2. So we read those two bytes. Now we have four bytes in our shift register and so on and so forth. So you can see kind of how we can transition between our states based on what's going on. Now, of course, we're sort of sweeping a lot of things under the rug here, but that gives us a rough idea of, of what, how our instruction fetch unit is operating. Um, again, we've kind of already talked about this. Our main execution unit is requesting either the 16 bits or the eight bits from our IFU. And here I've listed again, the 16 bits comes from the MBR2, the eight bits comes from our MBR1. Recall either of those can be signed or unsigned, which one we need and whether it's signed or unsigned, of course, depends on the specific instruction. And so again, going back to our go-to instruction, maybe the, one of the biggest ways we can see speed improvement here is getting that 16-bit offset. Right, so we went through that process on page 4-27. Like I said before, we have to read in the first byte into H, shift it to the left, read in the second byte, add that. Now we just say IFU, give me that 16-bit offset. All of that is done independently. That, along with those other things that we mentioned, are going to speed up our execution time quite dramatically.